Good morning. Welcome to worship at First Presbyterian Church of Columbus, Georgia. We're glad that you're here to join us as we worship God by offering our prayers and singing songs and listening to scripture. Please come in with us that we may worship God together. I'm Tamar, wife of Aram. We keep a small inn on the outskirts of Bethlehem, nothing fancy, mind you, just a clean room and a warm supper for the road weary. But it's a living. We have a dozen sheep as well. My son Itzhak spends his days in the fields with them, sometimes nights too. He's a good boy. There are times in the confusion and disorder of daily life when something grabs you and shakes you and cries out, take notice. Life is more than just your own four walls. The inn was full as usual the other night when Aram answered a knock at our door. By chance, really, I glanced by and saw a young man and his very pregnant wife, just as Aram turned them away. And I was grabbed by that intangible urgency. I saw the pain in the girl's eyes for one thing. Any woman knows that expression if she has carried children in her womb. I knew we could not turn away a woman ready to birth her child. But where would she go? Where could she stay? We were more than full. We'd given up our own beds to weary travelers. Every inn in Bethlehem would be the same. Well, you don't just turn someone like that away. As Aram closed the door, I caught his sleeve and asked, what about the stables, Aram? Couldn't they stay there? She needs a shelter and she needs it now. He opened the door to catch them and I hurried to ready a lamp, clothes, blankets, anything that would be needed to swaddle the babe soon to be born. 
I'd never midwifed before that night, and I didn't do much then. But a woman needs another woman close at those times. So I stayed, made her comfortable, and helped her deliver her son. The birth of a child is always a precious moment. But there was magic in our stable that evening. The smile of the new mother as she nursed her child brought tears to my eyes. I found myself washed over by a sensation too powerful to contain. In that moment, I knew. No, even more, I felt to the roots of my soul that God still loved me. Simple, heathen, little me. I was allowed to share in the birth of a new child. This was more than just the act of life renewing itself in my stable. Here, somehow, was a presence of God, reminding me, telling me, that love never escapes us, never leaves us alone. There's a new star in the sky. Well, new for me. I'm no astronomer. I first noticed it the night the baby was born in our stable. It was overhead and was magnificent. I wonder why I never noticed it before. As this star gives us light, so now I light the candle of love. Please be seated. Good morning. Welcome to worship this spectacular morning at First Presbyterian Church. If we claim that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God who is faithful and just will forgive us and cleanse us from all righteousness. Why do we pray together? We are a community. If one of us suffers, we all suffer. If one of us rejoices, we all rejoice. Let us offer our prayers in unison. God of the future, you are coming in power to bring all nations under your rule. We confess that we have not expected your kingdom, for we live casual lives, ignoring your promised judgment. We accept lies as truth, to exploit neighbors, abuse the earth, and refuse your justice and peace. In your mercy, forgive us. Grant us wisdom to welcome your way and to seek things that will change us to judge.
scripture assures us that in accordance with God's promise, we wait for a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness is at home. Friends, hear and believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Please be seated. Well, good morning, everybody. This is more like it. This is the way I like to see it, where there's just, you know, hardly any room to even sit down. Well, first of all, I want to congratulate you all on a wonderful performance this morning in our Nativity play. You guys did a great job, as always, and I really appreciate all your hard work. Excellent. Some people say it's like herding cats, but you know, they're good cats and they listen well. So I want to ask you guys a question. You had one line to say in the play. Can you remember what it was? God with us. Exactly. The word Emmanuel, which means God with us. And that's what I want us to focus on a little bit today is how <laughs> it's now they're going to ham it up for you, which I want to focus today on how God sent Jesus to be with us so that we can have that assurance that we are safe, that we are taken care of. And that's a really great feeling. You know, I had a conversation with one of our friends about our father and what it means to be a father. You know, Harrison played Joseph this morning, and Joseph was Jesus' earthly father, and he took care of Jesus, he and Mary, while Jesus was on earth. So we all have an earthly father, but we also have a father in heaven that looks over us and protects us, and that father is God who knows all things, who can do all things. That's a pretty comforting feeling when you think about it. So it lets you know that in times of trouble, like when things come your way, and you're not real sure how to deal with them, all you have to do is pray to God. And just like your father here, he'll help you through those difficult times. So we are gonna go up and take a little break from all of our hard work this morning, and we're gonna watch a classic Charlie Brown's Christmas. Yeah! So, before we do that, though, let us bow our heads and pray, okay? Dear God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for protecting us. Thank you, dear Father. Amen. Great job, everybody. And so it begins. Welcome this morning to worship with us here, and want to welcome those who are worshiping uh, through television at Spring Harbor and in other places and communities. Welcome. May you find what you need this day. I uh, also want to welcome everyone who is uh, here at the church today. I invite you to take the friendship pad and use that as a way of celebrating the fact that we are here together, and you'll find it in the pew rack near the end of the aisle. Um, I want to express my appreciation to Jim Campbell, who's assisting as worship leadership this morning as well. Thank you very much. Um, last week, after our worship time here, the congregation met and called the next pastor for First Presbyterian Church, the Reverend Danny Deeth, and he will begin on February 1. Yay! So, well done to work for the pastor nominating committee and for to the congregation, and may you uh, find that time as we make ready for that transition, may th you find this Christmas season and, and the time to come a blessing. Next Sunday is Christmas Eve, and as uh, we do on Sunday, we will have worship at 8.45 and 11 o'clock in the morning, and then that evening at 5.30, we will have a service of candlelight and communion here in the sanctuary. So please use those times of worship as a way of preparing yourself and celebrating 
the Christmas season this year. This past Tuesday night, uh, the session uh, met, and I'd like to ask Ed, Elder Ed Kenner to come forward and uh, present a meeting, uh, present a, a brief report uh, from that meeting. Good morning. It's wonderful to see everybody here today. It's a beautiful day, as Jim said. Uh, the session, uh, this is a brief uh, report of our uh, most recent uh, uh, evening session meeting. Uh, the session approved uh, the confirmation call to begin the confirmation process on January 21st for the sixth and seventh graders. Catherine Trotter will lead, be the lead teacher using the collaborative Presbyterian confirmation curriculum. The session approved an adult education class to be taught by uh, Dr. Albus on the Cotton Patch Gospels using materials from Clarence Jordan. We invited Reverend, Reverend Lynn Gifford to preach on December 31st and Deb Bibler of Flint River to preach on February 4th. Uh, we set communion dates for 2018 to be the first Sunday of each month at the 845 service in the chapel and the first Sunday of each quarter here in the sanctuary. In addition, we'll have a communion on Monday, Thursday, and Christmas Eve. We've approved changes to the Wednesday night program scheduled to include two Wednesday night dinners each month. Children's choirs will meet at the direction of the director of music. And on January 10th, we will have a, uh, a meal and a service for the new year. And on January 24th, we will have a meal and a, and, uh, a preparation for arrival of, the new, of new, the new pastor. We approved two changes to the child and youth protection policy, requiring a, a six-month membership prior to assuming leadership in children or youth ministries and also requiring additional review of the adequacy of, of our current training. We approved uh, using accumulated income from 2016-2017 from the Miller Fund to support youth ministry activities uh, such as registration fees for camps and conferences in 2018 and to update games and resources in the youth ministry facility. Uh, this morning, we also had a called uh, session meeting uh, to take uh, some additional actions that are required uh, at this time. Uh, the clerk completed a membership review, and based on the review of this uh, work, which was approved by the session this morning, the church roll is now 417. The session also called the annual congregational meeting to be held on January uh, 28th, basically to uh, take care of our, our business from last year uh, in a timely fashion. And the session also approved a transition plan to allow up to two weeks of overlap between Dr. Alvis and Reverend Deeth in, in February and uh, provided uh, two months of transitional leave for Dr. Alvis. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ed. As we prepare our hearts to listen to scripture, let us join together and sing the hymn for illumination. The Old Testament lesson this morning uh, comes from the book of Isaiah. Let us listen that we may hear what God will say. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for all who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, 
the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord to display His glory. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. For the Lord loves justice. The Lord hates robbery and wrongdoing. The Lord will faithfully give them their recompense and will make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants shall be made known to the nations and their offspring among the peoples. All who see them shall acknowledge that they are people whom the Lord has blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. In my whole being exalt my God. For he has clothed me with the garments of salvation and covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with a garland, as a bride adorns herself with jewels. For as the earth brings forth its shoots, and as a garden causes what is sown to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. The word of the Lord.
The second reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Luke. Let us listen that we may hear what God will say. In those days, a decree went out from the Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to the city of David called Bethlehem, because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged, and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child, and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. This is the word of the Lord. Scripture tells us a lot, but sometimes there are corners in the Scripture readings that hold out possibilities. In this story of the birth of Jesus, which is so familiar, in this story there are some corners. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. Let's start with what the story says what the Scripture says. It says that a census is to be taken. They call it registration in this translation, but an enrollment in the King James Version. There was a head count going on. We know that. And it says that Joseph was of the house and lineage of David in the King James Version. He was of the family of David, and so he went to the family home for registration, though he himself and several generations before had not lived there. So they traveled some 70 to 80 miles from Nazareth to Bethlehem. And it says that Mary was with child and that she was to give birth. Is there a donkey in the story? No? But you have to wonder, how do they get from Nazareth to Bethlehem, how do you travel 70 miles without a car? You walk, you ride a donkey maybe, you ride a cart, but there's no donkey in the story exactly. How did they, what did they take with them? How long did it take? It it wouldn't have been for us 70 to 80 miles, we can do that in a little more than an hour, right? depending on how fast you drive, of course. But it would have taken several days. How did they make their way? And then what about this inn? It wasn't exactly the Holiday Inn or the Comfort Inn. It was probably most likely just a room in somebody's house, maybe more akin to Airbnb than something like we would think of as a hotel or motel. And there isn't an innkeeper that's named. But there had to be somebody for whom provided this room. There are places and possibilities to think about these other aspects of this powerful revelation. The Advent wreath lighting today uses the reality that we can look into the corners of the story and we can hear good news. The Scripture can be amplified by what we understand. Tamar, described as the wife of the innkeeper, though not named as that, but in our own play, can be described as the wife of the innkeeper, and she provided testimony to what was seen and heard, maybe filled in some of those blank spaces. The birth of the child is always a precious moment, she said, but there was a magic hour in our stable that evening. The smile of the new mother as she nursed her child brought tears to my eyes. I found myself washed over by a sensation too powerful to contain. 
It was as if the mystery of God's love for this world, for Bethlehem, for this mother, for this child, and even for me consumed all of us inside that little building. In that moment, I knew, no, even more, I felt the roots of my soul that God still loves me, simple heathen me. I was allowed to share the birth of a new baby. This was more than just the act of renewing itself in my stable. Here, somehow, was the presence of God reminding me that love never escapes us. Love never leaves us alone. Love never escapes us. Love never leaves us alone. This character who came to visit us today testifies to God's love in the moment of that birth that transformed her and the world around her. Frederick Buechner is a author, theologian, Presbyterian minister, and he has written a tale, a different tale than the one we heard this morning, but he has written a tale told by the innkeeper. And the innkeeper in his tale is a character who is trying to make a living. After all, why would you want to invite people into your home or your place of business unless you were trying to find a way to make and provide for yourself and for your family? And that is what he was doing, according to Beekner's innkeeper. And because of that, he was distracted. He saw this couple come in. He describes them as being clumsy and not very, not very articulate. He had seen others like them. He let them in because they didn't have any place else to go, and he put them out in the stable, and he went on about his business. But then the innkeeper says he missed something. He missed something important. And he describes it this way. But I know this, my tr own true love, all your, life all your life long, you wait for your own true love to come. We all do. Our destiny, our joy, our heart's desire. So how am I to say it? When he came, I missed him. Beekner's innkeeper missed him. These are two different tales, voices that are not identified specifically in Scripture, but which we can hear in our own experience. Two voices that come to us. All of us have moments when we encounter something deep and profound and moving in our lives. There are moments when we are overwhelmed with tears. Sometimes they are tears of joy, sometimes happiness, sometimes weeping. We know that they are moving within us, and yet those tears can be elusive and confusing. Incarnation is the testimony that God comes into our world. No, it's God's world. God created the world. But incarnation is the testimony that God comes into this world, God's world, in human form. God has been there always, and God will always be there. The story of Jesus' birth is that God comes into this world to move through creation and to restore what has been lost. We live in a world where there is there are a lot of things that have been lost. An important part of the Christian faith is the story that we have lost these things, and we seek ways to restore what has been lost, to regain what has been lost, to put the pieces back together again. Sometimes 
we seek to put the pieces together again by seeking out substances or distractions. Our brains become wired for stimuli. We seek addictions and we hold on to them and, and things attach to our spirits and to our bodies in ways that are not healthy or helpful. There is a downward cycle sometimes, a tyranny, a tyranny of our emotions and of our attractions. Sometimes we seek to restore God's creation by taking on the role of God. We set behaviors and limits and we demand that other people adhere to what we know God wants. And when we do that, we descend into another kind of tyranny, a tyranny of hubris and arrogance. Both of these ways, in any other way, both of these ways are ways of trying to restore what we understand has been lost within ourselves and within the world. We need to be healed. We need to be restored. Sin is what happens when the good gifts that God has given us that are meant for the well-being of God's creation fall away, and we use them to feed our cravings that take us away from the light of the wonder of life, from the grace of simple goodness, and from the mercy of sharing. We take all of those things away and we descend into a darkness of the soul, a fear of anything that is different, an oppression of others. That is the world we live in, and we are seeking desperately to find the way out of it. So we come to prepare to celebrate the birth of this child, this child who offered us a different way of living. This child will grow up and will lead us to light and to life. This child will grow up and march with confidence to defeat the power of death. It is not simply the death of the body that he seeks to defeat. It is the death that cuts life short, that gives us the wrong reasons to live. It is the death that makes us live life without thanksgiving. It is the death of our spirit as well as the death of our body. And this one came to live and to rise up and to march into the gates of hell to defeat that power of death. We see and we learn about these encounters in different times and places, not only in the gospel stories, but also in those stories from the edge, from those that are there like the innkeeper's wife and the innkeeper. Each of us has our own encounters with this new life breaking into the world at unexpected times. You all have that story, or you have encountered it, or if you have not, I pray that you will soon. Let me tell you one story where I encountered it. I have shared this before, so I hope it does not wear on you. But for me, it was a story of the moment of clarity and power. It was a moment where I comprehended God's love as I never had comprehended God's love before. When I, was, when I went to seminary, I met a classmate. He, lived, he had lived for a while in Alabama, and he knew that I had gone to Auburn. And so the first thing he said, the, the first thing he said to me, was, oh, you're the guy that got his GED from Auburn. It did not go well. We weren't really close. But when you live on a seminary campus, you're always close. You're in classes together, your kids play together. There's always stuff going on. And so I knew him and his family, not well, we didn't have meals together, but we knew each other, and we were in class together, and we were around together. 
but he got sick. And so even though our campus was divided between people who were very traditional, very conservative, and very liberal, we all kind of found a way to come together. And when people got sick, we prayed for them. In chapel and in our homes and our devotional lives, we prayed for them, and we did. But he kept getting sick and more sick and sicker and sicker and sicker. And finally, the word came back that he had a viral heart infection and that the only treatment that would heal him would be a heart transplant. And so our community prayed for him and for his well-being. But as it is, when you, have, when you need a, an organ transplant, you have to get, you have to progress down the level of um, poor health so that you will rise on the level of transplant need. And so he got sicker and sicker physically, and his need rose and rose and rose. And finally, he was in the hospital. And it was at that critical juncture where if something didn't happen soon, there would be nothing to do. And so he was there. And my phone rang one night in my apartment. And I answered it. And it was a neighbor who said, a number of us are going to the hospital for a visit. Would you like to go? And I said, yes, I will. I went thinking that I would be part of a group of six or seven that were there, that we would go and support our friend, not by visiting him, but by simply being there and speaking to his wife. And she was overwhelmed. She was very appreciative that we were there. And she said, wait a minute, let me go tell him you're here. I know he can't see all of you, but he will want to see somebody, or some of you. And so she went back, and she called one of the others who went. He went back and visited for a few minutes. And then she came back, and she said, Joel, he wants to see you. What? Why me? Why me? But I went back. And, and he was connected, as, as people are in coronary care units, intensive care units. There were tubes, and there were monitors, and there were sounds, and there were beeps. Many of you know that by being there or having family there or all that things that we hear. There was all that there, and we were there, and we, we spoke. What's going on? What's happening? What's the progress? What's the next step? How, how are the children? All of those things. What's the possibility? Surgery, recovery, new life. What's out there? And then after a few minutes, we prayed. We prayed for the success of a medical treatment, and we prayed that a heart would be found for a transplant. It was in that moment that I realized that while we were praying for a new heart to become available for my friend, we were also praying that someone else would die. For that was the only way that he would receive a new heart. I prayed that prayer. And from time to time, since that time, I have prayed that prayer again for other people. It is a somber prayer to pray, but it is a prayer that is offered in love. Here, somehow, was the presence of God, reminding me that love never escapes us. Love never leaves us alone. Love never leaves us alone. May God's love come to you 
in this season as we look to the birth of a child who came to show us and to be for us the way of love. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please join me in our affirmation of faith using the Apostles' Creed found on page 12 in your hymnal. If you're worshiping with us remotely, I encourage you to, to uh, say the words as they appear upon your screen. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sat upon the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. I invite you to join your hearts with mine in prayer. Wonderful Lord, we come into this time and place to pray. We pray for those for whom we dare to offer a word of intercession. It may be those for whom we share often our needs, or it may be that we do not know at all but have seen their need from afar, or it may be someone that we have no idea what it is that they need, but we come in confidence and in grace to stand before you and for ourselves to offer our prayers. We pray for those who exercise power, the power received from election and the power given by calls to service. Be with our elected officials and move within them in ways beyond their comprehension or even our understanding so that they may do justice and love mercy and follow in your will. We pray for those who are charged to hold the safety and well-being of this community and all communities. May they be protected from harm and may they know wisdom. We pray for those who provide calls to service through the power of election in our society and through our support of our government. 
Be with all of us, Lord God, all of us in need. Keep us aware that we are stewards of your creation. We are stewards of the creation that you have made in the world, and we are stewards of your body of Christ, the church. We pray for all of the ways in which your church gives life and shares vitality, connections of organizations and ministries that we have in this community and throughout the world, and those that are far beyond that we are unaware of. We pray for them, Lord God. Provide well-being to those who are in need, those who need food and shelter, those who need community and relationship, those who need meaningful work, those who need good health, those who need a strong and peaceful mind. Provide the physical, emotional, spiritual needs for all of your children in this place and wherever your name is called upon. We give thanks, Lord God, for all of the saints who have gone before us, and we anticipate with thanksgiving all of those who will come after us, and we give you thanks for all who are gathered here now. Through the words of the prophets, you promised your people the Redeemer and gave hope for the day when justice would roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. We rejoice that in Jesus Christ, your Son, the Savior, has come, and that He will come again in power and glory to make all things new. We offer our prayer in the name of this Christ, and we pray in the way that He taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. God so loved the world that he sent his Son. Let us share our offering and gifts to reflect that love.
Loving God, we present now what you have brought to us, things that are both visible and invisible. The coins and paper represent our work and express in a clear and visible way our love and thanks. But we also bring as an offering the fragile dreams and hopes that we have. These invi invisible gifts are what sustain our lives. Receive all that we have brought in love, God. Amen. Love never ends. God's love never ends. And it holds you and pursues you in places and circumstances for which you are unprepared, yet always prepared. Receive God's love in this season. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit surround you and be with you as you breathe in and as you breathe out. May it accompany you this day with every step you take and always with every stride you make. Go in peace. Amen.
It's been a privilege to join you this day in worship. We're glad that you were here. First Presbyterian Church seeks to serve and minister in the name of Jesus Christ. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord be kind and gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor. Go in peace as you love and serve God.